so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to extend a very warm welcome to our seminar speaker, Professor Tim Fisher, today. Um, it's nice that we're able to have you um, virtually and hopefully at some point in person. Um, Tim has mid Midwestern roots in Illinois. He was at Purdue School of Mechanical Engineering for 15 years. Um, he's currently department chair and received the John and Claudia Sharman Indoor Chair in Engineering at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, his group works on multidisciplinary research in nanoscale heat transfer, carbon nanomaterial synthesis, um, coupled electrothermal effects in some semiconductor and electron emission devices, um, and thermal energy storage and conversion materials and devices. Uh, amongst other things, his group works on both um, computational methods ranging from atomistic to continuum scale simulations, as well as experimental measurements. Um, Tim is an ASME fellow and he's active through a variety of responsibilities and service activities um, at ASME. Uh, for folks who have um, and maybe have not checked out Nano, Nano Hub, which is an open access learning platform, um, Professor Tim Fisher has a variety of uh, sort of foundational courses there. And I've even um, taken one um, as a grad student. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great resource. So I definitely urge uh, students to check it out if, uh, should they be interested. Um, Tim has won several uh, national prestigious awards. We won't get into the details of it because there's several of them. Um, with that, um, I want to uh, again welcome Professor Tim Fisher um, for today's seminar. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Professor Chandran. And uh, everybody, I hope you're keeping well. <clears throat> A couple of caveats uh, as I start here. I'm not on campus. I, I go in about half the days um, and at some point during this talk, if the Amazon person comes to my front doors, you will see a dog's attacking it uh, or hear my dog's attacking the front door. Um, I'll try to mute myself when that happens. Um, but it's really a privilege to, to be here and to talk to you today. Um, the, uh, I will say, I always try to make you know give it some local flavor so my sister is a michigan grad my sister-in-law is a michigan grad um there are also many ohio state grads in my family but i will not mention them by name um but again thanks to everybody and and uh what i do when i give talks and you know i've been doing this so long or too long um instead of having just a list of names here i just usually have a picture in their name um that's related to the slide uh, that I'm talking about. <clears throat> and so I'll do that here. Um, also, I wanna, I always try to, to thank uh, technical staff. Uh, I had the privilege of working with great people at Purdue generally, and especially at their nanotechnology center. And the same applies to the folks at UCLA. Um, outstanding staff is uh, part of the lifeblood of, of good research institutions. And then, uh, you know, financial support <clears throat> from a variety of places over the years, uh, that each of which has contributed something to the topics that I'll uh, talk about today. I will uh, warn you, I, I tend to uh, gear my seminars toward uh, the graduate students. And so, you know, some of this is going to be biographical because uh, often students want to know, you know, what I did and when I was, you know, in their shoes. And so I'm gonna spend a few minutes here telling you a little bit about that. Um, and so I started my academic career at Cornell um, and my advisor was Ken Torrance, his pictures there. He passed about eight years ago, he's a wonderful man. Um, he uh, did his studies at University of Minnesota. Professor Chandran likes that place I hear. Um, uh, but I also had wonderful teachers. And so they, these people that are listed here inspired me. To, um, to be a good teacher and to learn. Um, and interestingly, I, so I, I, I worked or I, I did my undergrad degree. I worked while my wife went to graduate school and we lived in Chicago. I worked for Motorola back when Motorola was a really good company. It was the Apple of the day um, back in the early nineties. It's not anymore, but, um, and then I went back to grad school. Uh, my wife graduated from Cornell too. So um, that was a good place for us. <clears throat> but I worked on a surprising topic, at least it's surprising to people today. My doctoral dissertation was on chimney flow. So it's not very exciting. It certainly is not nano. 
um, or micro. Uh, but it taught me a lot of things about heat transfer and just how to do research. Um, and while I was uh, in grad school, this started happening, right? So we had two kids while I was a grad student and the third was on the way when I, when I uh, defended my dissertation. And then I moved straight from Cornell to uh, wonder, another really good institution, Vanderbilt, uh, the Dean Ken Galloway there. Um, his quote is on the left. <clears throat> In my second week at Vanderbilt, the Dean who hired me told me I was going to fail, um, which is a really interesting way of motivating people, but that was Ken's way and he was really good. He's probably the best academic administrator I've ever known. I didn't think so at the time, however. Um, but what Ken was telling me was that I wasn't gonna get anywhere with chimney flow. And I had to find something else to do. And what I found was a really good collaborator, uh, senior faculty in electrical engineering at Vanderbilt, uh, Jimmy Davidson. Um, he, he's lo long since retired. Um, but uh, I, Jim really got me into you know, thinking about, especially carbon nanomaterials. He was doing diamond, and so he was, you know, or his nickname was Diamond Jimmy, um, and that's kind of where I started with things. Um, and you know, this other stuff, life kept happening as well. Um, so we always took pictures of our kids on the first day of school. Um, so I stayed at Vanderbilt for a few years, but um, I moved to Purdue, which is where my my father went to college. Um, so I know it's a Big Ten rival, although not so much. I mean, Purdue football is nothing like Michigan football. You know, maybe basketball is a little more competitive, but uh, Michigan beat Purdue in basketball last week. Um, but for me, it was always a special place from when I was a little kid. And uh, what happened was I had done enough in this thing that they were now starting to call nano um, back in 2001, really, when this was happening, that you know, Purdue was like all other universities really at the time was trying to ramp up in, in nanotechnology research and they uh, found a building. Um, but at first they didn't have the money for it. So I, I didn't go in the first kind of opportunity, but the second time around, once they had a big donation from an alum, they said we want, they, they wanted me to help them build up their nanotechnology center um, and so that, that's when we moved. Um, there's a little story in this last bullet about um, sharing lab space. So the, the electrical engineering department wanted someone to do carbon nanotubes so bad they actually gave lab space to a mechanical engineer, which is almost unprecedented in the history of mankind, right? The person who did that was the electrical engineering department chair at the time, Kent Fox. He's now the president of the University of Florida. So. If you want to go into a life of administration, I think that that's a good lesson, of, you know, being a big thinker. Um, yeah, so anyway, we always dressed up our kids as in whatever school colors we were at the time. But I spent 15 years at Purdue. I loved it. Um, and, uh, you know, I certainly uh, have fond memories and still a lot of interactions. Uh, what happened when I moved to Purdue is, you know, this thing called nanotechnology was taking off and a couple of the people that were instrumental in pulling me in were Supriyo Dada and Rashid Bashir. Rashid's now the Dean at University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. Supriyo is still a, an icon at, at Purdue. Uh, but they showed me that literally the picture that you see here. They had written a proposal to NASA to create a nanotechnology center. And they showed it to me after I, you know, shortly after I arrived at, uh, at Purdue. And they said, Tim, you know, we, we want you to work on this program. And, you know, we, this is the proposal that we made and we want you to work on this project. And I said, oh, that's great. Cause you know, any new faculty member, actually old ones too, if someone says they have, you know, research support for you, you say yes. Um, and so naturally what I did is I looked at the picture and I said, okay, well, who's doing this and you know how far have they gotten so far and their answer was really funny they said that's it all we have is the is the cartoon and the proposal you have to go make it um <laughs> and so that's what we did um and i ended up uh, interacting with some wonderful wonderful people 
Um, and we made it. And, you know, this is the proof that we made it. And, you know, lots of really interesting papers. We never really, you know, cracked the, the hardest part of the problem, which is getting, you know, semiconductor chirality all the time. Although we, we made some progress in that direction. Um, but we made fe vertical field effect transistors very much like the cartoon. Um, Tim Sands was a big part of that. So Tim was a material scientist who came from Berkeley and arrived the same year I did, but he was much more senior. He's now, by the way, the president of Virginia Tech. All these people end up like running off into administration. I, that's not me, but you know, that's their choice. Um, but the other folks are, are fantastic too, uh, who worked on this. Matt was the main student for um, the beginning part of the synthesis. He's now a professor at, at his alma mater, Missouri Columbia. Dave Lubelski was a great staff member. Aaron Franklin was a student and he's a, he's a professor at Duke now and David Jades is still a professor at Purdue. So it was a wonderful team. It was probably you know, the, some of the most exciting days. Uh, you know, every, every day something interesting and new was coming out of the lab. So that was, that was a blast. Um, then in, in 2017, uh, I moved to UCLA and not uh, for any reasons having to do with negative things where I was, but just a different opportunity and including family opportunities. And so uh, that's where I am now. And I tell people I'm not going anywhere. Um, UCLA doesn't have many, many problems in the way of retention anyway. It's once you get here, you kind of stick you know, for lots of good reasons. But maybe if there's a big earthquake or something, I'll rethink that. Um, but uh, Dean Murthy, Jayathi Murthy is the dean here, and she was my mentor at Purdue. And so she was a big, uh, a big draw for me, but I collaborate with Laurent Pilon, and Chris Lynch was the department chair. And unfortunately, Chris left after my first year to become the dean at a different place, and so they, they stuck me with the job. I'm the department chair now. Um, a reluctant servant leader. Well, I'm reluctant to take the job, but I'm a, a, in a servant leader role that I'll, I'll rotate out of in a couple of years here. So anyway, so my family's grown up and now we raise dogs. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, let's, let's get into some of the technical things. Um, I wanna talk about scales um, and, and in, a, in the broadest sense, right? So. You can see that a lot of what I've done has spanned over scales, and I, I wish I could tell you there was a rhyme or reason to it, but not really. Um, you know, I, you know, as opportunistic as, as the next person. However, now that I think back on it, um, what happened to me was I did have a chance to practice scales, and practicing scales is not something that's just reserved for length scales or time scales in science, right? Um, great artists practice their scales and um, <clears throat> you could see there's a quote here I won't read it to you you know you have to practice right to in order to be great at something almost everybody does except you know true prodigies um, Malcolm Glad Gladwell wrote this book that's a, you know it was a super popular book called Outliers and he said 10,000 hours is the magic number for being great at something and interestingly if you actually do the math on that right you, the grad students, the PhD students in the audience should think about how many hours will they spend in their PhD program? And it turns out it's about 10,000 hours. So it takes a lot of time and effort. Um, there's other nuanced analyses, right? So, so the social scientists took Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours and you know, they, they studied it and it's not always 10,000 hours, but it's close. Um, you can, if you want the, 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 the details of that, the, the citation is in the slide. All right, for us, let's talk about thermal things. Um, so for me, I'm you know even though I started out with chimneys, I'm a I'm a really bottom up thinker, and it's there's not one right or wrong way to think about problems, you know, technical problems and research questions. Um, but I definitely you know over time started thinking from the bottom up. So that's the way I'm gonna I'm gonna pose this slide. So <clears throat> at the atomistic scale. The question is, how does the arrangement of atoms affect how energy flows? And in, in most of my cases, I'm talking about heat flow. And that leads to trying to understand atomic configurations and how they influence the carriers, right? So carriers could be phonons or electrons, sometimes photons too. Um, and so that's the starting point. And, and one of the things that you'll notice in what I do is 
you know, I don't really just leave it to somebody else to make the material. I, you know, if I want the atoms in a certain way, I, I try to make them. That way. Um, I don't always succeed, but, um, but I try. The next scale up is the, what I call nanoscale one. So how do we, you know, take the knowledge from the, the, the atomic arrangements and put them into a device that, that is useful for something that has some kind of impact at the human scale. So here's here you see a, a transistor device where you have a silicide contact to uh, a silicon channel, and then you have source and drain, um, you have a gate. There's all kinds of interfaces and different atomic structures here. And the question is how do we you know make those you know, most efficient so that you know we can use the least amount of power and when we do burn power how can we get it to flow away so that it doesn't burn up everything else some other questions that get beyond electronics are how do we control composition through processing so i'm not somebody who really ever liked the idea of taking a bunch of nanomaterials maybe you know in in large volume and mixing them around and coating them and putting them back together into something not because it can't be done, but a lot of times with the nanomaterials, especially for those of us who were at the beginning of sort of the nanotechnology, nanomaterials um, paradigm shift, we weren't sure about the health implications. And so I always wanted to make stuff and keep it and not move it after we made it. Um, and we, we've done that pretty faithfully in my group. Um, and then the question, and this is really the you know, contemporary still burning question, you know, if you make a nanoscale widget that does something awesome functionally, how do you create a process where it goes fast enough so that it can be economical uh, for human beings to use? And that's still a very open question with a lot of nanotechnology and, um, you know, some, some progress, but not enough as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then there's this sort of mesoscale, right? So micro to macro, how do we take sort of domains of objects that are that have some special feature, put enough of them into uh, a grouping so that they can have a, an impact at the human scale? The electrical engineers are great at this, right? They have nanotransistors, but they make billions of them. And they, put them, they have to put a lot of other stuff around, all the IO and the packaging that goes with it. Um, and you know the electrical engineers are, are a good example of how to do it right. Um, I don't say that when I talk to electrical engineers because their egos are already big enough, but I, I will say it to you. Um, so, and then lastly, and certainly not least, is the you know so this would be the top-down starting point and it's the ending point for me, which is the system level. So once you have an object that does work at the system scale there's, or, or, or at the human scale, how do you incorporate into, it into a system where you know, people can use it, uh, people can design around it? Right? So all these questions, I know I spent a lot of time on this slide, but I, this is my philosophical technical slide. You know, how do I think about problems and where the gaps are and uh, opportunities? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to touch on some of these scales. And I apologize, you know, this is not, yeah, I, I personally don't like highlight reel seminars. Um, and so I'm going to go deep on one of these and then I'll go into highlight reel mo mode on a lot of the other scales. So this is, this is kind of a combination of the first two that I talked about, the atomistic and nanoscale one. And the question that we were asking here, and you saw an example of this, you'll see it again, you know, at a metal semiconductor interface where a lot of heat is being generated nearby, how does heat flow across the interface, right? It turns, it's, it's an important question, you know, scientifically, but also one that has very high relevance um, in, in application because of the semiconductor industry, basically. And, and you know, the, the fascinating part of this is that no one really knew. I mean, even, you know, 10 years ago, sure, you could make measurements and you could say, well, this is the, this is the net effect of whatever these processes are, but people didn't really know how it happened. Um, and maybe today they still don't, but maybe you know, part of my uh, purpose here is to convince you that, that we figured out uh, a good chunk of it. So this was done at Purdue with Jaithi Murthy. 
Um, and then a bunch of electrical engineers. Gerhard is still there at Purdue. I think Tillman's moved on. Pai was a student. Uh, but the student who did most of it was Sridhar, and he's, he's just amazing. He, he works for Intel now um, in their device modeling group. But then the last but not least, so I did a sabbatical, and this is important mainly for the faculty. So I did a sabbatical in India, took my whole family there and spent the semester. And Umesh Wagmari, who's like the champion uh, theoretical physicist in India, like he wins all the prizes, um, he taught me this, right? So he taught me density functional theory. Um, I would sit there, have tea with him every morning with, with uh, you know, Sridhar. Sridhar was oftentimes on the phone, but I had another student with me. And, um, and this is where I learned it. So old dogs and new tricks can happen as well. All right, so, so to motivate this a little bit, so what you see is an eye chart, I understand that, but I'm gonna start at the top left and then you know, focus on that. So back in the early 90s, Stoner and Maris wrote this paper about how <clears throat> the theories of uh, metal uh, semiconductor, metal insulator, uh, thermal conductance, that's what this thing is here. And you'll see different units, I'll try to, I'll try to explain it through. Um, the theory is down here, this is a log scale, was so far off, an order of magnitude off. This is a lead diamond interface. And, and, P, and the theories, these are the any of the curves, the continuous curves here, they couldn't explain it. And so they had some ideas about how to do that. And then you've seen lots of other things that have come up since then. Um, but, you know, especially I would say, you know, it took, it took maybe a, a, a decade or so to soak in David Cahill's done some wonderful work. That's this stuff down in the bottom left on um, kind of cataloging the interfaces and bounding the limits of this. Bottom right, Patrick Hopkins at Virginia does the same kind of thing. This is a gold silicon interface. Um, and then this work up here, this is, uh, the, this, these are different models. So this, this is a really good example of sort of engineering curve fitting, right? So, so now we have, this is a resistance, not a conductance, but it's just the inverse. Um, and so you have time domain thermal reflectance and you have, you can fit these curves to different values of that interface conductance. This also was, was gold silicon. Um, and really there was no unifying theory around this. Um, it was really kind of these measurements, the, almost all these things are measurements, not a good theory to explain it. And they were off by a lot. So what I did with Sridhar and Jayethi, um, and actually, Supriya, if you remember him. So Supriya Dada has developed and, and promoted over the decades this uh, non-equilibrium Green's function, non-equilibrium Green's function method uh, for modeling things atomistically. And that was for electron transport. Most of what we're talking about here is going to be phonon transport. So, so we go ahead and take this this Landauer formalism, and you know, I hate to put you know just big long equations in front of you, but my point here is that we really need to find this transmission function. So this is a transmission function in frequency space for energy flow or charge flow, frankly, uh, between a hot and cold reservoir, okay? The charge flow would be relevant to thermoelectrics, right? And this is the formulation that we use to do it. And all the atomistics, because we have bulk contacts, right? And, and when we do experiments, we have bulk contacts. If you're measuring the temperature of something, it, it ought to be a bulk contact. All the atomistics sit inside of this script T, that's the transmission function. And so we, we, we figured out a way to, to handle that. Um, the application again that, I'll, that we'll talk about today is this, the interface between the silicide, which is a metal, by the way, um, so it's a contact metal and silicon because most of the, so if this is the drain area, most of the heat is generated right here where my cursor is and it, it's going to want to go right across that interface um, into the tisilicide. Tisilicide is also the contact metal over here. And so that was, the, this is the driving uh, motivation for solving this problem. So what we ended up doing, and we had to make some compromises along the way, um, lots of them, but, uh, but not, you know, what we tried to avoid as much as possible was kind of curve fitting things. Um, so we chose cobalt psilocyde instead of tie psilocyde. And the reason for that will become apparent later. It, it turned out it was easier for us to make a pure sample of single crystal cobalt psilocyde, actually 
um, Joe Fieser, he'll, he'll pop, his picture will pop up soon. He's at Delaware. He's the one who actually ended up making it. Um, but the principles apply to thiosilicide as well. And cobalt silicide is also used as a contact metal. But the, the question really that we tried to you know, ask and answer is, you know, what, what's the nature of these heterogeneous bonds? So I have silicon on the left and I have cobalt silicide on the right. And the question, do we need to really understand that that heterogeneous bond structure or can we kind of average it or kind of you know, wave our hands about it? Um, and so a lot of the things, you know, the, the DFT calculations that we used are here. And just so everybody knows, and this will come up a little bit later too, right? Whenever you do DFT, it's not like you can take an actual device and say, well, here's a bulk contact in, of one material and here's a bulk contact of another material and the interfaces in between. You have to use periodicity. So all the simulations are done in, in super cell, in super lattices, right? But we just make the super lattices big enough so that we can focus on one interface without the influence of, of nearby interfaces. And we, we tried to normalize that out or make sure that, that, we, that our, um, that our uh, super lattice size was such that we could make the argument that, that that was not a big effect. All right. So then what we ended up doing is we took a twist on Suprio's uh, non-equilibrium Green's function method. And I wrote a paper with Natalio Mingo um, way back when, 20 years ago on what we call the atomistic Green's function. The difference between them is that the atomistic Green's function is for phonons, whereas the, uh, the NEGF is, is typically for electrons. And you know, even though my fonts aren't the same and all these things, at the end of the day, this Green's function approach, what you have, end up having to do is make a, a harmonic or Hamiltonian matrix for your device. And then you have to connect it to two contacts that each have their own harmonic matrices and the bridge between the two become these self-energy, these contact self-energy matrices, right? Once you have all these things together and there are books and you know, we've written about it a lot, uh, <coughs> you end up you know, taking these things and you, in, in sort of linear algebra, you, you turn them into a transmission function. And I wish I had more time to be, give a tutorial on this. So we've written a, a monograph about it that, that a lot of people um, have, have read, um, and that's probably the best starting point. All right, so the, our first question was, do those heterogeneous bonds, so those, those are the ones, the last one in the cobalt psilocyte and the last one in silicon, do they matter? And the answer to that is they do. Um, so we took two things. We said, well, you, we'll use the DFT bonds, right? So we, we think of those as being you know, the most physically accurate. And then, so that's in the blue, okay? And in the, the magenta or fuchsia colored, that, that's what a lot of people had done up to that point, which is to take the bulk bonds of silicon and the bulk bond of cobalt psilocyte and average them and say that that's what the nature of the heterogeneous bond is, right? And it's a really, you know, sort of intuitive, good first guess but it turns out that you know when you do that, the interface conductance predictions are off by a factor of two or so. Which, frankly, if you're going to plot everything on a on a log scale, that's not so bad. But we wanted to not plot things on a log scale. So um, that's that's where we we started. I think that this is an important result. Um, so the size, this is, gets back to that super lattice size, right? So we have short and long, right? and the longer you go the more computer time it takes. And you know, then your students who are doing, who are running the simulation start to ask questions like, how many decades is it gonna take me to get my PhD? And those sorts of questions come up. Um, and so it's, it's a compromise. Um, and what we did, so is, you know, we, we saw at least in looking at the transmission function, that's the important thing again in, in the Landauer setup. Uh, that the shorter and longer supercells were reasonably close. And then Joe Fieser, uh, he made a really nice cobalt psilocyte silicon interface for us. And we ended up you know, getting experimental data. Uh, we couldn't go above 300 Kelvin. David Cahill has complained to me that, Tim, you should have gone higher. The problem, the reason we didn't go higher is that this is, this was, uh, these are measured also in, in Joe's lab. 
with thermal reflectance and the temperature coefficient of re reflectivity for cobalt silicide happens to become insensitive to temperature above this point. So we couldn't go to higher temperatures, but you could look at this curve and you could say, oh my, look at the green. I like the green, right? The green matches the blue and, and we should be really happy, but we weren't. Why? <clears throat> because the underlying model of the green uh, says that we have a rough interface. It's the diffuse mismatch model, okay? And it should, it's the opposite, right? Look at that interface, right? It's smooth as can be. This is very close to heteroepitaxial growth, and yet a rough interface model is the one that fits it best, okay? So that was something that we had to really scratch our heads about. Believe me, the temptation was there to just go ahead and say, let's call it a day, you know, use the DMM model for this interface and, and you should be good. And maybe that's good enough for some people. Um, the DMM model is really, really, really simple. It's basically just the, the weighted sum of the number of modes. That's another thing in the Landauer formalism. Uh, but we went further than that. So, so really what we started to do is say, well, how can we have, you know, what's really going on here? Um, in these in this pathway, and so the question we asked, and this is this is something you really have to think about in a quantum mechanical sense. The question we asked is, um, knowing that in the metal side the dominant thermal carriers are electrons, the semiconductor side the dominant thermal carriers are really the only ones are phonons. Is it possible for the wave functions of the electrons in the metal to tickle the wave functions of the phonons in the semiconductor in such a way that there's a transport channel? That's really the, the fundamental question. There are other sub questions about inelastic and elastic phonon scattering that we had to deal with as well. That's listed on this chart. Um, and if you want to look at you know, how we handled those, uh, some, some of the papers are, are here that are, are, are listed. Um, but what we did, and so this is, this is important for you to understand, right? It, to do multi-carrier DFT, it's not like you just put all the carriers into the computer and just go. You actually have to create sort of, you know, coupling elements inside of the atomistic model. So this is a phonon dominated model, but it's mediated by electron phonon interactions. And those electron phonon interactions are mediated by these little purple things um, called Boudicca probes. And so this is something that physicists have been doing for a long, long time. And so we put those into the, into the code with appropriate uh, scattering models. And so we, and part of the DFT does give you that. It kind of gives you those, those gammas um, that you see here that will take, that will make a self energy matrix for the Boudicca probes. Again, it's it's a little bit in the weeds, but it's um, you know it's still what I consider to be sort of a basic principles approach as opposed to fitting. Um, the other thing that we did is we looked at different supercell sizes, one, two, and three here. And you know once we got to a place where these things, as we moved away from the interface, the interface is at zero, right? If if the um, if the coupling strength was was constant along here, then we, we said, oh, that's converged, all right? Um, and so this is the coupling coefficient. It's a, uh, this is the electron phonon coupling coefficient. This is just to show you, this is what I'm doing is really telling you about all the little steps you have to make in atomistic modeling uh, to, to be able to come up with something like this. Um, we also looked at density of states uh, at, at the interface and away from the interface. But ultimately, this Eliasberg function is the one that controls that coupling rate. And that's something that comes from the DFT. Um, and we've written papers on that for, for tisilicide silicon as well. Um, that I think, you know, if you're interested, you should, you should definitely read those um, in addition to, to this one. All right. So this one, this graph is, uh, you know, the graph I'm most proud of in my career. I, I kind of doubt that I'll ever be more proud of a graph. Um, so now <clears throat> you remember what we had before. The experiments here are blue. We kept green for the, for the uh, uh, kind of the final result. But what we did is we sequentially added different transport processes. So we started out curve A 
gives you only elastic phonon processes, and then curve B gives you elastic and inelastic processes, okay? Um, C does this, those two um, with only electron phonon coupling. This is that sort of wave function interaction um, in the metal. And then D, which is the green one, the one that you know, we care about, um, has electron phonon coupling in through the first two unit cells, which is again is enough. Least we judged it to be enough. And so this green curve fits the blue experimental data um, without any significant uh, you know, fitting factors. Um, and, and you know, that is, to my, to my knowledge, the first time that it's been done, at least for this class of problems, with a metal to semiconductor or insulator on the other side. Um, and so that's, that's the end result. It seems like a simple little thing. Um, and we could have stopped at the diffuse mismatch model you know, long before this and still match the curve, but now we feel like we understand it. Um, so here's a little tutorial on, you know, so one of the things that people ask me is, you know, when I add a channel of conductance, how can I, uh, how can it decrease the, the interface conductance? And really what it, what it comes down to is, you know, when you're adding different channels of energy flow, um, and you're using sort of a linear theory to interpret, that's, that's what the interface conductance is, you could actually see that there are, you know, if you, if you have resistors, parallel resistors on both sides of the interface, you can actually add a channel, but still get less, um, less conductance, apparent conductance, but it's just an apparent conductance. It's because the, it's because the um, you know, a, an interface conductance model doesn't really account for the slopes of these lines in the, in the bulk material. Okay, so what else is new in this regard? So Yi Jun is a student of mine um, who does DFT and she's still, uh, she's just about done. Um, but she worked on photoconductivity in bilayer graphene. So it turns out that bilayer graphene, unlike single layer graphene or graphite, has this has a really interesting photoconductivity response. So you shine light on it and it becomes much more conductive. And I know that again, it's or sort this sort of eye chart, and I'm going to start to go into highlight real mode. Um, but the the photoconductivity is the change in conductivity as a function of the frequency of light that's hitting it. And her curves, right, and the ones to focus on, and we had to do some kind of fitting of, of apparent Fermi levels. Um, but certainly the, the uh, cyan colored curve here matches the experimental data, which are in the, uh, which are uh, in the symbols, the real and imaginary parts of the, of the photoconductivity um, very, very well. And you know, I I could show you what the previous modeling produced, which was a semi-classical Boltzmann transport theory modeling, but um, it's too far off the graph to to show. Um, and so we we were able to use the same kind of multi-carrier coupling concepts in this case, light and actually this has light and uh, electrons and phonons because there's the phonon electron uh, scattering model baked into this. Um, that produces, you know, a physically accurate result. That's, uh, you know, that's accurate spectrally. I think that's important too. Like most people, if you measure photoconductivity, you just say, well, you know, I'll shine light on it, probably a broadband light, and see how the conductance changes. But this shows that you can do that on a spectral basis as well. All right. So now I'm going to kind of be in full. Uh, I'm going to be in full. Highlight real mode, uh, apologies, but it's fun. I mean, and, and certainly if you have questions, feel free to stop me. So uh, at the level of controlling nanomaterial morphology, this is mainly through the synthesis process, it's important. Um, so we, like so many other people, right, we're interested in uh, electrical or electrochemical energy storage. Uh, everybody wants a battery uh, that lasts longer, um, that has higher energy density and has higher power density. The only people that don't want the longer lasting life are the, the battery companies, at least some of them. Um, so you really want to be up here. Supercapacitors are, and I'm, this is what I'm going to talk about mainly, you know, they already have enough power. There's very few things at this high end of the power range that, you know, or applications need that much power. But they're really bad at energy density. And it sure would be nice if we could take the power 
part of this. This is sort of for fast charging or for you know, very, very high power outputs. Um, and couple that with a much higher kind of an energy density that's that's in the um, the battery range. And so another way of looking at this, and this is what I showed to my undergraduate students, um, you know, if you look at this this Ragone plot again, power versus energy, normalized by weight or volume. You know, if you look at super caps, they're high in power but low in energy. Batteries are low in energy but high in power. And then you have this other thing up here, IC engines. Of course, I'm talking to people in Michigan, so you all know how much of an impact that had. And a lot of times, and this is also log scale, students, new students are surprised by how much gap there is between these things, you know, batteries um, and supercapacitors and, and IC engines. There's a good reason why people really, really, you know, liked and developed IC engines. There's lots of bad reasons that we know more about today. But it's not like people were using them uh, just uh, you know, kind of willy-nilly and, and ignoring the, the other consequences. They have really, really good attributes um, on this graph. And that's, that, that was the key driver. So what we started to do is to look at different flavors of nanomaterials and kind of you know, hybrid nanomaterials or combined um, nanomaterials. So we took... Um, what uh, we took graphene petals or thin graphitic petals, that's the GP here. Goping is the student, uh, I should have mentioned that before. So Goping, uh, he's now at UT Dallas on the faculty. Pinga uh, is on the faculty in China at uh, USTB. Um, the, the, uh, but what they did is they said, well, we have these, these sort of graphitic petals. I'll show you what those are in a minute. And on top of those, in a hydrothermal process, they grew these uh, hydroxide uh, nanoneedles, right? So these things can store energy too in a sort of redox type of way, whereas the graphene can do a little bit of intercalation, but it, it's mainly a, a double layer type of storage. So we're kind of combining different functions as well. And so when we made these nano needles, of course, the first thing you have to do is to know what you made. And all this slide tells you, that, you know, the, the hydrothermal synthesis recipe is up here, at least the summary of it. Um, the graphs on the right, the EDX maps, just tell you that we actually do have a pretty uniform mixture of the different elements, right? So it's not, you know, domain segregated or anything like that. Um, and these are the petals. So this is, I spent a lot of time developing processes to make uh, graphene pets. Sometimes you'll hear these called vertical graphene. Uh, they're thin graphite. They're usually you know, eight or 10 layers thick, um, but they have lots of surface area. They're anchored well to the substrate. Um, they have a lot of good advantages. You know, it gets back to what I was saying before is that I've tried to focus not on making you know, nanomaterial powders in bulk and then playing around with them in the lab because you know, I think that, um, oh, well, I'd just rather, and not take the risk of, of that uh, and, and keep them where, they, where we grow them the whole time. And then you can see here, you can see some of these nano needles, right, that are growing off of the petals. And, um, and so that was, a, that was an interesting uh, observation. Another thing to recognize here, I won't spend too much time. It's an just an interesting, um, I don't know, inconsistency in the field. So, so we always wonder, so now that we have sort of a, the, the hydroxide things, they, it's really kind of an electrochemical, it, it, it's pseudo capacitance, but it's like a battery, right? You're actually having a, a reversible chemical reaction as opposed to a surface charge layer. So the ACS, they look at the, uh, the cyclic voltammogram I'll go back a step. And so the bird's beak, characteristic bird's beak in that. And they say, well, if it looks like that, it must be a battery. And then the RSC looks at a different graph that says, oh my goodness, you have this really, really flat energy density, right? Um, and so if you have that really flat energy density, then it must be a supercapacitor, right? And that goes off to this really high power density or a pseudocapacitor. And I don't really care what you call it, but it's been interesting to go through the review process on these papers. And you know, if, you know, if you send it to ACS, you better call it a battery. And if you send it to RSC, you better call it a supercapacitor. Um, 
So when we made these things, uh, Guo Ping, the student, uh, well, at the time now, again, he's, he's uh, on faculty, but he, he took me, he, he brought me the left-hand picture here, right? And he said, oh, Dr. Fisher, look at this great thing I made. Isn't it beautiful? And it's got all the surface area and it'd be very reactive. And I kind of dismissed him and I said, oh, you know, you, you, haven't, you haven't actually put it into, into a cell yet, have you? And he said, no, no, no. Um, but, and, and so I told him, I said, I think it's just gonna all break down. It'll decrepitate. That's the word that some people use for that to sort of, you know, degrade. Um, but he brought it, af brought it back to me after 3000 cycles. Later, we did many more cycles than this and it, it holds up. And why does it hold up? Well, it's kind of a beautiful mechanical engineering concept, right? If you have these nanoneedles uh, that are going to react and expand and contract their, uh, as they take up or give up charge, um, then, you know, if they're sitting right next to something else, then they're going to create local stresses. But if they're pretty much isolated, they can grow and shrink and, you know, without interference and they, they hang together really, really well. Um, and so we've had these things, you know, so we can cycle these at a volt per second even 5,000 volts per second, and they do really, really well. So, um, you know, this was a fun um, kind of hierarchical nanostructure thing that we did. We also took, uh, we also took that same idea, but instead of, you know, having a separate uh, inorganic material, we actually grew those petals and it's, yeah, I'm glad that I can have my pointer here. So this is a petal that's sitting on a carbon nanotube. And the reason we did this is we figured out a way to make these carbon nanotube arrays that actually self form into a conduit, which is really good if you wanna you know, bring electrolyte, uh, liquid electrolyte in. The problem was when we did that with just car pure carbon nanotubes growing off of carbon fiber, um, once we put them in solution, they would just collapse and become carbon nanotube spaghetti. And we needed a way to, for them to hang together. So what we did is we just had to kind of tweak our, our recipe. Once we had grown the carbon nanotubes, we changed the processing conditions in the same chamber. Um, and we grew petals off of the carbon nanotubes. And after that, they stayed together, right? So they, they didn't collapse because of the interference between the graphitic petals it kept the mechanical structure. So again, the theme here, again, is, uh, you don't have to read all the charts, but the theme is that, you know, it's some fairly simple intuitive mechanical concepts actually can work at this scale um, and, uh, and, and, you know, completely transform the, the performance and behavior. All right, so then I also did, uh, I worked on, on biosensing. So Jonathan Clausen, he's really doing this now. He's, he's at uh, Iowa State um, and he's taken this. Uh, and so we, I know we have to finish up here. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go really fast, but, but we did biosensors. And so this is glucose sensing. And uh, with the same kind of principle, we decorated the, um, the petals and, and carbon nanotubes. And we had, you know, a really good linear sensing range. Marshall Porterfield's faculty at Purdue who helped with that. Pedro Hirothoki took that same kind of um, structure and system and put it into a wireless sensor that you could uh, implant. And it worked there as well. So that was fun. Um, nanomaterials going faster. I've done some things lately in uh, roll to roll plasma deposition. We actually built this chamber that you see here. We designed it, um, had it custom built, and then it didn't really work when we got it because our design wasn't quite right. And so we rebuilt it once we had it. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we do diagnostics uh, with Bob Luck uh, at Purdue. Um, and so, you know, doing diagnostics. So, so here's some science in manufacturing, and that's my purpose here is to talk about, you know, there are some really interesting and deep science that can go into, you know, what is considered to be kind of a, a rudimentary uh, branch of our discipline, which is manufacturing. Uh, no offense to manufacturing people, I'm, I'm just saying what I hear, but, uh, but there's plenty of ways that, that there's great science um, all throughout um, advanced manufacturing processes. 
Um, there's data science, and this is uh, work that we did with Ilias Bilionis to, to design our experiments. I, I love what's happening in data science and being able to uh, really pinpoint optimal conditions. Um, and I think that's a great place to be right now. Um, you can kind of see that in this middle figure here where we were varying pressure and looking for, this is a quality metric of, of the things that we produce. And you can see that there's this sweet spot right here. Um, you know, we want this, we want this to be low, this number, this ID to IG, that's the, the Raman peak ratio. We want it to be low, and indeed, it seems like you know we are able to find that. And so this is uh, this is uh, that paper. The references here. There's a picture of Ilias. Um, we also do sequential experimental design. That what that means is um, instead of designing your entire experiment up front and then going to execute it, you run it for a little bit, and then you come back and look at what you learned, and then you design uh, another set. In this case, we did. We ended up doing six sets of that, and it gets you to the final answer a lot quicker. Um, so getting into some other things about the human scale. So this is that mesoscale. I'm really interested in, uh, partly in just the artistic quality of, of the way nanomaterials combine together, but we ended up using it for um, granular mechanics um, applied to battery electrodes and also to carbon nanotube arrays, which is something that we did, you know, a long, long ago. Um, here's a simulation uh, where we're looking at, uh, at battery electrode material in granular form, faceted granular form, and how does it, how does it connect together? And once you do the mechanics of this problem, right, this is what Kyle Smith did. Um, uh, once you do the mechanics of this problem, then you can look at transport questions. But before you have the mechanics, I mean, before you can do the, the transport problem, you really have to know what the structure looks like. So we took that structure and we did things like, you know, simulated thermal conductance through it, which gives us an effective thermal conductivity. Um, so, so that was a lot of fun too. And then we applied it to electrochemical, right? So this is discharge capacity, um, same principle. Right. And, um, and again, a lot of that started, well, it all started with just, you know, mechanics, so mechanical engineering principles. All right, this is my last main part, right? So this is, uh, I, I'm going to go through this. So at the system scale, lots and lots of people, um, you could look for your friends um, who worked on uh, aerospace systems. So uh, this is, I'm just going to show you one thing from what we're doing in aerospace systems recently. Um, and so this is flash boiling. Uh, I had some good chats today about, um, you know, I think Solomon and others were interested to, to see, you know, my idea here is just that, and you can see this happening. So this is methanol. What we do is we flash it with pressure. Instead of waiting for the temperature to rise, we actually use, we actuate the pressure. And in doing so, these are thermocouples that are uh, sitting next to heaters on the bottom, okay? And they, the heat turned on at a respectable level, I don't know, 40 or 50 watts per square centimeter. And the temperatures barely change because we pre-cooled and timed it with the thermal latency of the path between the heat source and the, and the coolant. And the, the temperature barely changes when you turn the heat on. Um, and there's really nothing else that I've seen like this. And the reason it all happened is because we pre-cooled and we crashed the, the, uh, the fluid temperature by depressurizing. Now, this only lasts so long. There's lots of other things that you can you know, nitpick about. Um, but uh, using pressure to control boiling heat transfer processes, I think, is a very ripe area for a lot of innovation. Um, and you know, that, that I, I think, is... Uh, a place to go for whether it's boiling or condensation or uh, evaporation. So, all right, this is my last slide. I've five minutes left. Good. Um, you know, I'm, I won't read the slides to you. You know, we have you know scaled the scales, right? And really, I started from the chimney scale. And then I quickly went to the bottom end, and you know, there's a lot of fun stuff in between. Um, one of the messages is that you know there's i think that controlling 
So if you want to work in an area that involves advanced materials, if you can do it, make the material yourself. And it might seem like a, a huge burden to, you know, up front to figure out how to do, and, and it is. But once you can do it, then you have so many more degrees of freedom uh, to change. The other thing is that when you, a lot of these, you know, sort of exotic, you know, interesting, cool materials, their performance is still, you know, influenced by and limited by, in many cases, mechanics, like the stuff that we learn as undergrads. Um, and, and so don't discount that part of it. Um, and then finally, you know, I think we all need to pay attention to scaling up and getting to the human scale. And that's a big driver for why, um, you know, I was, I, I've been working on roll to roll processes and trying to figure out a way that, you know, nanomaterials or at least nanomaterial augmented uh, systems can have a bigger impact at the human scale. So um, these are some benefits of practicing scales. I will tell you that, you know, there's a lot of people in my sort of generation who worked on nanotechnology who have the same ideas about this, which is, you know, they acquired this deep expertise in nanotechnology, but when they tried to translate it, especially to stakeholders like industry, um, having this attention to scale is important. Um, and it is a, a important part of the pathway to impact, whether that be through companies or through entrepreneurship. So I will close there, mostly on time. I know I raced through the very end. Um, this, is, uh, this is my, uh, I was working in the lab one year and this came out of one of our processes. So I brought it home on Valentine's Day, it did not go over well. So I use it here, hoping that it'll go over well uh, with this audience. Um, and then, you know, if you ever come out here, this is at our faculty retreat from uh, a couple years ago. Um, you're you know, certainly welcome to, to stop by and visit us, uh, you know, anytime when there's a polar vortex in Michigan is probably a good time uh, after COVID. So that's an open invitation to you. And with that, I will close and take any questions. Thanks so much, Tim, for that um, excellent talk and also taking the time out to share your um, career path. That was very interesting um, in terms of learning about the profession of various things. Um, so uh, people who might have questions, please post them on the chat window. Uh, I think Ellen already has a question. So maybe Ellen, do you want to unmute yourself and post your question? Sure. Um, so the, I, I don't remember what slide it was, but the slide that had your favorite graph on it. I was just curious if it um, is reasonable to assume that the phonon coupling depth is constant over that temperature range, whatever that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Ellen. Um, so it, our temperature range is not that wide in this experiment. And so I think for this, for these, this set of results, it's fine. So near room temperature. Um, there was some work in the mid 90s that I didn't cite, but maybe I did, um, Overhauser at Purdue, a physicist, where they made this uh, joint modes, right? So the, the joint modes at an interface, and these are typically phone on phone on modes. Um, and their model, which was, you know, had, had by necessity had fitting constants and sort of scattering models built in, it did not have temperature dependence built into it. Um, but I think that uh, the, the question of, so we also do a lot of work in thermionic emission. And yes, once you get, so, so it turns out that um, in a real material, in a real metal, there are electrons hitting the, the potential uh, boundary, which is known as the work function, you know, at huge, huge rates. It's just that they bounce back. And it's an exponential function. It's a T temperature squared times E to the work function over KBT uh, minus on that. And so, so yes, it's a T squared type of dependence that I would expect. That's my, you know, but, but I think in our situation, it was, it was not, um, you know, our temperature range was, was pretty small. Okay, thanks. Um, Solomon, I see that you posted a couple of questions. Maybe you want to post yours? Yes. 
Do you hear me now? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, yep. excellent, uh, excellent talk. I was, uh, it's uh, it's very insightful. Thank you for the talk, uh, Tim. I have two You're questions. Uh, the first one is, of course, uh, during our meeting, uh, we discussed this a little bit. I'm very interested with the flash phase change. So my question on that one is, how much do you lower the pressure? How yeah. significantly? And the second so, so question is, I want you to answer them together because of time. The second one is the glucose sensing. What's the smallest concentration you are able to detect? I saw on the plot millimolar, but if you have any uh, further information. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the answer to the first question is we generally try to get, um, we try to get a few, yeah, maybe 10, 10 kilopascals or more below the saturation, um, right. below the saturation pressure at the starting temperature. So generally speaking, that's what we do. And if you, of course, if you don't get to the saturation pressure, then you won't flash. Um, but but the lower the better. And methanol, you know, it's it's a little bit complicated because methanol is uh, you have to get to fairly low pressure. So I think you have to get to at room temperature to get it to flash. You have to get it to like 10 kilopascal. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a little bit lower, but you know, methanol is easier to work with and safer to work with than some of the other things. But we we have ideas about going to other coolants. It's just that you know we're time and money, um, yeah. you know, get understanding the process since it's so new. We've we've stuck with methanol so far, although I do have one student who wants to switch out. Um, but generally, you know, you have to get to that level at least and. Uh, the, so some of the times, just so you know, what we do is we'll artificially increase the, the starting temperature so that it's closer to saturation temperature, so it's easier to get to that point, um, just for our fundamental studies. And the second point, um, let me go back to the, the question of... Um, glucose sensing. Yeah, now you can see my slides on the left. It, even though I went really long, it, it could have been much longer. That's, that's, what the, that's what these things on the left show you, because I... I cut out a lot of those slides. Um, so we got down to, you know, I, so this is the linear range. And again, these, these things here, again, I was racing at this point. So this is these amperages that you see here. Those are the actual electrodeposition amperage. So we put, we decorate the, the nanomaterial with metal and we do that in the electrodeposition process. So we are optimizing that here. But we got down to about 0.1 millimolar in the linear range. Okay, and so that, that's the thing that people like the most about this. Uh, I'm told, I, know I haven't really confirmed it, um, but I'm told fairly recently that our linear range somehow is still the widest that there is. But Jonathan at Iowa State, I know that he's gotten down into the micromolar range on some of the things that he's done. I'm not sure if it was with glucose. He does a lot of other things. You know, he's in Iowa, so he does a lot of sort of uh, agrochemical sensors and things like that. I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tim, for the answer. Actually, it's the linear range that's more useful if you think of making a device for glucose sensing. So I think that's uh, that's a good answer. Thank you very much. And uh, I definitely am going to follow up with an email as we discussed about the flash evaporation and the flash con uh, flash content. You put something in my head, so I'm gonna follow up with good. an email. You know, then it was worth it, right? If I if I influence one person positively, it was worth it. So I'm glad and I appreciate your comments. Yep. I was actually for some reason, Solomon, your picture was the one that was stuck in my thing. I saw you smiling all the time in my talk. So I knew it was okay. excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Great. Um, I'll probably just get one last question in. Um, so Tim, I'm really interested in the uh, in learning more about the roll-to-roll -roll processing that you were talking about for the carbon nanomaterials, especially in context to maybe using them as encapsulation materials for, say, low conductivity thermal energy storage materials like phase change, or mm -hmm. even salt hydrates. So you know, do you think this roll-to-roll -roll processing that your group is working on could lead to promising avenues towards that end? I do, but only in the in the yes of course sense, right? So we haven't done anything 
Um, but yeah, roll to roll processing is uh, you know something. Of course, it was a big deal with uh, with flexible electronics and NSF programs, and you know we th this work was funded by part of that. But um, I think there's much more to do, and really anything that's mechanical um, that touches on it kind of combines with the interesting material and nanomaterial material or other. I I love because you know the you know, I'm a mechanical engineer at heart, and um, and I love to to apply what I learned as an undergrad, even when I didn't expect it. So yeah, there's a lot to do. Great, thanks. Um, I, I don't see any further questions. Um, so with that, we'll officially um, close the seminar. Thanks again for your time today. Um, very interesting stuff. Um, Good. Thanks to everybody. Thank you very Stay much. Stay well and uh, and. You know, keep going. We'll get through this. So, thanks. Yeah, excellent job. Excellent talk. Thank you, team. Thanks. Stay